Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Monday, May 3rd. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Orr. The Minnesota game is in 122 days. The game against Michigan in 208 days. We spend a lot of time talking about the Ohio State football team on this show, but Brian Day's program is not the only championship winning football team on Ohio State's campus. My guest's name is James Grega. He is the head coach of the Ohio State club football team. He's a former member of the Ohio State football beat as well, and in the interest of full disclosure, a good friend of Gerd and mine. James, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. Really excited to be here. So, James, can you let people know a little bit about the program, the club football program, and how it works? Because, you know, this isn't a varsity sport. Everyone knows varsity sports. And if you went to Ohio State, you probably played intramurals or something. This isn't varsity. This is inter- intramurals. This is like a whole separate thing. Yeah, it's 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 we fall under the Office of Club Sports at Ohio State, which is under the Rec Sports um, office. But we are, you know, a full contact 11 on 11. We play. Um, with NCAA, our league, the National Club Football Association has adopted largely the NCAA football rules uh, of gameplay. So we operate largely under there with a few exceptions, obviously. But yeah, it's, it's, it's full contact. We've been around since 2009. Um, this will be my fourth full year as a head coach uh, in 2021. Third, technically, because we didn't play in 2020 because of COVID. But um, yeah, it's, it's not quite, you know, a lot of people, when they hear club football, they immediately think intramurals. No, this is not flag. This is full contact football. Um, we play, I would compare us to a lower tier D3 program. Um, we don't have quite the numbers of a D3 program. We usually operate with about 35, 40 kids. Our goal is to reach the NCFA uh, roster max, which is 50. Uh, we've come close to that, hitting that. We've never quite hit that, but yeah, it's full contact football and uh, it's the real deal. So how do you put your team together? Is this just you kind of blast something out in the lantern like, hey, come try out? Or are yeah. you recruiting people who are who you think might be good fits? Are people coming to you? Are you hearing from coaches? You know, like how, how does like putting this team together actually happen? Sure. So there's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, obviously myself um, and all of my assistant coaches, um, we're all volunteer None of us are paid. We treat it, and I treat it very much like a full-time job. Um, and I know s- most of my assistants do as well. We take this very seriously. Um, but when, when it comes to recruiting, since we are technically volunteer and we all have other jobs, um, we very much limit ourselves, unfortunately, to just recruiting the Ohio State student body. body. Luckily, Ohio State's got you know, 50,000 students, so there's a lot. There's a huge student body to pull from. Um, but we usually have to keep our recruitment to just what Ohio State, their student body has to offer. Now, there are going to be some instances where, you know, I've got some high school coaching connections and I've got some connections elsewhere where uh, they'll be referred to me or they'll know about us going in. And uh, we had talked a little bit before, but we get a lot of kids who were recruited to play D2, D3 ball. Um, but these, some of these smaller schools might not offer their preferred major. So what they'll do is they'll come to Ohio State, they'll find us. And so that's how we get a lot of our players is, you know, guys who could have played D2, D3 ball are extremely talented, um, but came here to get their education. And, you know, we we get a hold of them and and they still get to have the complete, you know, college football experience, playing fully padded football, competitive football, um, and still get the the great education. So it's a little bit of everything. You know, I do have some high school coaching connections where I'll kind of put out a plug. I'll say, hey, if you think you've got a kid who – you know, he can't play at the D1 level, but he could play D2, D3, um, and he would want to consider Ohio State. Um, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk to him. And, you know, we've got spots for kids. So it's it's a little bit of everything. But, um, you know, when the, when the team first started, it was essentially putting up flyers in the gyms, you know, at the RPAC, at, you know, J.O. South, J.O. North. Um, and obviously we've kind of evolved now with social media blowing up. We're big on social media and we You know, when I took over as head coach, created a team website where players could, once they find out about us, fill out a recruiting form. So we're kind of all over the place and we just try to dip our toe in different areas and and try to find guys that that way. You mentioned that you typically don't have division one level talent. You have, however, had several players move up from the club team to the varsity team, like the, you know, the one that Urban Meyer used to coach, the one that Ryan Day coaches now, like that, that varsity team at Ohio State. So how does that work? You know, are you reaching out to them like, hey, I've got this guy who looks like he might actually legit be able to help you guys. Are they calling you and just kind of like checking with you to you know, just say, hey, any, any promising yeah. prospects? How does that work? 
it's kind of varied uh, with the different head coaches at Ohio State. So under Urban Meyer, um, he did a lot of walk-on tryouts. They usually did one in the fall and one in the spring. The one in the fall, they're allowed to have like a football and do like actual football drills. And, you know, if you're a receiver, they'll watch you run routes. If you're a quarterback, they'll watch you throw. In the spring with NCAA rules, they can't do that. It has to be more of a combine. You know, they can watch you run a 40. They can watch you lift. But that's about it. That's all they can do. Can't do anything with a football. and They can't do anything to coach you. Um, and Urban Meyer would do a walk-on tryout usually once or twice a year. Since Ryan Day has taken over, and COVID, is, I imagine, has played a big part in this, but there has not been a walk-on tryout since Ryan Day has taken over. So in the instance of Chris Booker, um, he came to us my first year as head coach in 2018. And it was, you know, he had been a, a Dayton, which is Division One non-scholarship, and he was, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else, uh, most everybody else on our team and just about everybody in our league. And it was just so apparent that he belonged on that higher level. And a lot, I know a lot of people have seen the stories about him from the fall and the Fox Sports special, but um, it was just clear he was a special kid. So I personally said, you know, we've got, I've got to make a pitch to try to get him to that next level. So after our season in 2018 was over, I, I met with him and um, a couple of our other players who I deemed, you know, worthy of at least promoting to the, the varsity team and put together some highlight tapes for them and for Chris um, and sent them over to, you know, Justin Perez and their um, like player development staff. Um, and, you know, they didn't reach out right away. You know, at first they weren't interested um, and they just, they were in the middle of the season, but sure enough, come June or July, they had called Chris um, and had a meeting and, uh, and they ended up taking him in July of 2019, kind of right before fall camp started there in 2019. So um, how it works now with Ryan Day's group is essentially if I get a kid that I think is worthy of a spot or I think could compete and help them on scout team or what have you, um, I'll kind of promote them. But they really don't come to us. It's kind of me going to them and say, hey, I got this kid. You should take him. Well, you mentioned Chris Booker, and that's a name that I think people who follow Ohio State football pretty closely will will recognize that name. He was someone who, you know, this wasn't just like, oh, look at you. Good for you. You're playing. You, you get to be a Buckeye for real. Like, yeah, he was contributing. He was playing on special teams in the college football playoff. He played in the college football national championship game last year. Like, sure. what was that like for you as a coach to look and go like? I mean, that is that is like as you've made it as a moment. You know, this is not this is not like a cute little Rudy story. This is like. Right. This is a dude who can play D1 football and we've been have been a part of his journey like that. That had to be awesome for you. It was cool. And you know, quick story about Chris is the first time I ever got to coach him, we were playing an exhibition game in club. And we had a situation where there was a paperwork mix up and we only had like 13, 14 guys clear to play. And as a guy coaching his first coach as a head uh, first game as a head coach, I was petrified. I even asked the guys before the game, I said, unless everybody says they're they're comfortable playing this game, we're not gonna play the game. And it, 14 guys to a man said, well, we want to play coach. And so we had to coach again. I had to coach an exhibition game in 90 degree heat with 14 guys. Um, Chris scored a touchdown on each side of the ball. He had a touchdown catch, a pick six and a kick return for a touchdown and had a two point conversion catch. And we won the game. And it was like the next day I sent an email. I said, this, this kid has to, to go. But to, to answer your, your first question, I mean, the Nebraska game, the first, you know, game, this fall after coming out of that COVID pause, um, you know, he's named special teams player of the week, made a tackle on special teams. And I, I got just as excited for him to make, you know, a tackle on kickoff as I did for any of the touchdowns that were scored all year. And um, to see him, you know, play against Clemson, to see him play against Alabama and be on the field in those situations, it's, it's so gratifying. And it gives me, you know, I'm so obviously so happy for him and so proud of him and, you know, I, I would not be surprised if you saw – he can play offense or defense. He can play receiver. He can play corner. He can play safety, truly. Uh, he's a very versatile kid. And I wouldn't be surprised this fall uh, in 2021 if you see him, you know, getting in um, in certain situations other than special teams because he is that, that talented. He does put in a tremendous amount of work in the weight room. Uh, I know from what he tells me, you know, Mick Marotti, the strength staff, love him so – um, I wouldn't be surprised if you if you see him on the field more than just special teams uh, this coming fall because he is such a talented kid and he is such a hard worker um, and he, he he's so deserving of everything that's that's coming his way. 
Well, you know a lot about what it takes to be a good club, club football player because you were a club football player at Ohio State back in the day. Um, what made you want to do that when you were an Ohio State student? And, you know, what was that experience like for you to just, you know, could, to get to continue to play football at a, at, a, at a high level? So when I first came to Ohio State, you know, I went to the Mansfield branch campus my first year. And so my first year actually in Columbus on the main campus wasn't until my sophomore year, which was uh, 20, the fall of 2012. And so I had been out of football for two years from high school and I was just kind of missing competition. I was missing football. You know, I could have probably played D3, but I didn't really try to get recruited. I, I, had, I didn't have a great experience my senior year. So I kind of thought I was done. I found somebody had mentioned to me that Ohio State had a club team, which at the time they were only in their third or fourth year of, of existence. So it was early on in, in the program's history. And um, I went to a practice, found it, loved it. Um, it was. So it was a it was competitive football. It was full contact, but it was also a little more lax to where, you know, we're obviously, you know, we're not there for football. We're there to get the education. We're there to focus on classes. So it wasn't this full time commitment where you're there six, seven days a week and then you've got to go to classes. It was the perfect mix of like you have the competition level. Um, it is, you know, it is competitive. It is full contact, but it was also just lax enough to where I felt like I could still get my education and I wouldn't have any drop off. Um, in my grades. And so, yeah, it was, it was, it was competitive. You know, my, my, my favorite memory from playing in 2013 um, was we beat Denison's JV squad, you know, and Denison has a beautiful campus. Obviously that's where Woody Hayes got his coaching starts. There's a lot of history there um, and getting that experience and, you know, kind of proving to yourself that, Hey, I could have played D3. We beat a, you know, a, a team with, you know, paid coaches, you know, they've got, you know, we don't even have the headsets on the sideline, you know, and this is a, so it's always kind of gratifying when you beat those teams and you kind of prove to yourself that, you know, if that would have been a route that I have chosen to go play D3 ball, I, I could have made it there. too. Did you always know when your playing career was over that coaching was something you wanted to maybe potentially get into? Or was this just like an opportunity that sort of fell out of the sky and it was too good to pass up? I didn't think coaching was something I wanted to do until I started playing club football. And like that 2013 year where, you know, I was a starting quarterback and we didn't, we had um, two coaches who were, again, volunteers. We only had two coaches at the time. They were both kind of defensive minded. And at the time, we didn't really have an offensive coach. So a lot of the time it was me and our starting center in the huddle calling the plays, um, which is super unconventional, um, obviously. But, you know, we, we had a winning record that year and we beat Denison and we beat some really good teams that year. And that's when I started thinking like, wow, I might I might have something here if I can you know, I wasn't the most athletic guy in the world. That's why I could never play any position other than like pocket quarterback, like anything else would be a disaster. But I thought, well, I have the X's and O's knowledge. And if I can, if I can execute at a decent level at, at the club level, I know I can coach it. Um, and I knew I would probably be a better coach than I ever was a player. So uh, at the time, you know, I was a journalism major at Ohio state and I thought, well, I was, the only thing I was good at in school was, was writing and so and I obviously loved sports. So sports writing just made sense. Um, but coaching was something that kind of came along towards the end of my college career where I was like, you know, this might be something I want to pursue. Now, you guys, as you mentioned, did not get a chance to play last fall. So this is still the last games you got to play two years ago now, 2019. They sound like they were probably fairly memorable for you. You beat Coppin State to win the league. OK, that's pretty good. Beat Columbus State, the not the Columbus State in Columbus, in Columbus, Ohio, for the one from Georgia to win the national semifinals, and then you beat Oakland University up in Michigan to win the national championship. Yeah, seems good. Seems good. Um, what was that like to win a national championship in just your second season as a coach? But you know, having having that history in the program, like, what did that mean to just to get to the top of the mountain there? It was so cool, man. Because you know, I had been an assistant with the program for a while, and uh, no disrespect to the head coach that came before me. Um, but I just, I saw things kind of in the sitting back that I knew could be better, that could be improved. And, um, you know, once they, they decided to make me a head coach, there were some changes I wanted to make and there were some things that I wanted to do. And, um, you know, in year two to see all you know, the kind of vision that I had and some of my assistant coaches had too, to see that vision kind of come to life was, was really, was really exciting. And to see the gratification on the player's face too, because that's why you do it. You do it for the players. And, um, you know, it was that semifinal game winning a national championship obviously is, 
you know, getting to hoist the trophy was such a big deal. But I kind of equate it to Ohio State's run in 2014, where I think more people remember the Alabama semifinal than the national championship game against Oregon. Um, and that's kind of how I remember our national championship run was that semifinal against Columbus State from Georgia. Um, we played down in, in North Carolina and we had you know seven hour drive the night before we get down there. We played the game and we thought we're, we get to go to, you know, we're all from Ohio. We get to go down to North Carolina middle of November or late November. We think we're going to have good weather. It was 40 degrees and like rain the whole game. And uh, the te- that was an unbelievable Columbus State team. And we went down 14 to nothing in a blink of an eye and our guys didn't flinch. Um, our guys, you know, stayed with it, stayed with the game plan. We made some adjustments at halftime and we were able to come back in the uh, late third quarter and hold on for a win in the fourth and win 17 to 14. And that game always sticks out in my mind, not just because of the way we came back to win, but because after the game, the, like, it, I think it, when you think about, I always compare it to the 20, like the Alabama game. But then um, if you'll remember back to the 2017 Ohio State Penn State game where Ohio State has this great comeback. And there's players like sobbing on the sideline because of how hard they had to work um, and how you know difficult it was to come back, scratch, claw, and how big that game was. I mean, we had guys in the locker room on the field after the game, like tears coming down their eyes, and we won. You know, usually that's an end of the year. You've lost. Your season's over. You know, the tears come down. We had guys, we had had this unbelievable comeback win, and we almost every starter to a man had like tears in their eyes because – they we had worked so hard to get to that point and there was that scare you're down 14 nothing right out the gate and you think is this it it's hard for those thoughts not to creep into your mind so um that win was is always what stands out from our 2019 season that was a special year for sure well and, and i'm just going to run down your scores from that 2019 season so people understand why why that game kind of really stands out uh win 41 to 7 win 42 to 7 win 41 to nothing win 46 to 2 what happened there? Come on, man. Get it together. Block win- extra point. Oh, these, yeah. yeah. All right. Got to fire that special teams coach. Yeah. Win, win 37 to 8. Win 35 to nothing. The national championship game was win 36 to 9. Like, you're just blowing people out all year. And then the semifinal, win 17 to 14. Like, that is, that, that, takes, some, uh, that takes some guts to uh, have your first real challenge all year come in that, in that spot and be down 14, nothing like, yeah, I, that seems like a pretty memorable game. And that was such a, they had a great team. And, you know, when you talk about club football, especially at Ohio state, we do have, we do go against some teams in our league that have fully paid coaching staffs and they have the capacity to recruit local high schools. And that's one of the uh, Columbus state is one of those teams where, you know, they've got a coaching staff of seven, eight guys and they've got the full 50 man roster and they recruit. And so one of the hardest positions for us to recruit um, on campus is big guys, is offensive and defensive linemen. Usually, if we're, you know, if we're lucky, we go too deep. I mean, truly, if, if, if it's a good year, we go too deep. So that game, we just, you know, we had a lot of, you know, you're, you're late in the season. We had a lot of guys dinged up and um, they, they had us kind of in the trenches. They were a little bit bigger. Uh, they had more depth in the trenches. And um, it was raining the whole game, like I mentioned, so it was hard to throw the ball. So that first half offensively, um, it, like I said, it was a grind just to get back into that game. But we made some big plays in the air in the second half. We had no choice but to air it out despite the weather conditions. And uh, um, our quarterback, Kellen Garenstein, and our receiver, Jeff Green, just made some unbelievable plays in the second half, and uh, we were able to eke that one out. So, yeah, that, that game will always be special for me. Well, and that was two years ago. Last year, as you mentioned, you didn't get to play. So right. how much were you able to actually do with the team over the past 12 months or so? And then what has it been like to really get back with them again now, finally, this spring and sort of get start stuff at least, you know, sort of started back up? Yeah, initially it was a lot of Zoom meetings, you know, a lot of film, you know, watching 2019 film over Zoom meetings. You know, um, I think the hardest part has been we've got probably, I would say, 80 percent of our current roster, our projected roster for the fall is guys who have never played for us before guys who have never put the pad or put our Jersey on, you know? Um, so that's been the hardest part is getting them acclimated to the playbook. Um, and that's obviously no fault of their own. It's we haven't been able to have the, the full team out there since that national championship game against Oakland. So from the time everything stopped last March, basically an entire calendar year, the following March, we, we weren't able to gather as a team. So it was a lot of Zoom meetings. 
a lot of things like that. And after a while, you know, kids get burnt out with the Zoom meetings because there's only so much I can go over in 12 months. You know, there's only so much film I can watch with these guys. So um, luckily, early this March 2021, we were able to get workouts of like uh, 10 or less, you know, do the workouts of 10 or less. So it was really nine coaches and myself um, and basically conditioning, agility training. So guys would have to sign up for the workouts. Um, and we would do some playbook stuff with the guys we had, but it's been great just to be out on the football field again. You know, it, it's still hard to do the playbook install cause I can't have the full 11 on either side of the ball, um, out there. So that's been a struggle, but just to be around some of the players again, and just to get the guys out there and be out on a football field, having some sort of organized practice has been exciting. Um, so hopefully, you know, by the time we come back in the fall, um, everything is as close to normal as it can possibly be. And hopefully we can get back to, to playing because I think it's really hard for our guys. You know, we see high school football still going on. We see obviously varsity athletics, which obviously, you know, they bring in the money. So they're obviously going to get to play. But we see I think we see high school guys playing and it's really hard for us to sit back and and not play because even, you know, D3 programs in the area got to play at least three or four spring games exhibition games what have you so um the fact that we'll have been off for almost two calendar years by the time we come back in august um you know it's going to be that first game is going to be interesting because i would say 80 85 percent of our roster is guys i've never seen put on pads before so that's that's the biggest thing that that we're going to have to work with and but it's been nice to get some of those guys out there and see what they can do I think over the last 12 months, I think we've all learned that life is a little bit all TBD, but it sounds yeah. like your fall this fall, like you have a schedule in place, but that's a little bit TBD still. Sure. But you mentioned that first game right now, that first game is a return to Denison. One of the yeah. uh, memorable moments from your playing career, you get to come out, come out here to lovely Granville, Ohio to play, yeah. uh, play the big reds JV. You know, what, what do you have planned for the rest of the season? Is that, is are you kind of playing your regular league schedule right now, assuming everything sort of goes according to plan? Yeah, so luckily, the majority of the teams that we're scheduled to play are in-state. Um, so our only two um, non-conference games that we have scheduled right now are against uh, Roosevelt University, which um, used to be Robert Morris Peoria out in Illinois. We played them uh, in 2019. And then we have a national championship rematch with Oakland, and we're going up there. They had actually come to us in uh, – 2019 for the first game of the year and then we got to play them for the national championship game so um we but other than that miami toledo wright state are all in our division uh in-state opponents so um we're all we're excited to to play those guys and kind of renew some rivalries we we always say that miami ohio is like our michigan game that's kind of been our in division rival but um yeah we're excited we're excited to get back to it and and see some familiar faces uh, some familiar opponents Please, please. That would be the team down Southwest. Come on. Yes, that's that's follow, a good way to put it. Follow tradition. Come on, James. Yeah. Uh, so let, let people know where they can find the team online. You've, you mentioned you have a website where they can find you on social media if they want to follow you guys along. Yeah. Uh, Club Football OSU is our handle on all social media, Facebook, Twitter uh, and Instagram. So it's all one word, Club Football OSU. And then our website, is, you know, it's kind of long winded. Uh, OSU Club Football dot WordPress dot com. Um, is, is, is our site where, you know, if you're interested in, in playing your prospective player, you're, you're enrolled or going to be enrolled at Ohio state, we've got a quick recruitment form that you can fill out, um, to get in contact with myself or some of our student representatives, student player representatives, um, that we can try to, you know, bring you on and get you acclimated as fast as possible. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at. You know, we're, we're trying to build a team. We've, we've got a good base. You know, we just announced our, our 2021 captains yesterday. Um, and, you know, those are guys who played with us in 2019, won a national championship, know what the expectations are coming back. Um, so we're excited about the group we have, but we're, we're always looking to add more players. Um, obviously, I've got a good base of coaches. You know, most of our coaches are guys who either I played with or have played in the program at some point. They get it. They understand the culture and, again, what's expected but I'm always looking to add, you know, some more assistant coaches. So um, if anybody wants to get in contact, those are the easiest ways to go about it. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, let our listeners know a little bit more about the club football team and good luck this fall. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.
Well, this is the college football offseason, but the uh, pace of news has not really slowed down a whole lot at BuckeyeScoop.com. Our team of insiders is working overtime right now as we head into the reopening of visits and the uh, end of the college football recruiting dead period in a little less than a month. There is going to be a ton of action of uh, visits, camps, players committing, players potentially decommitting, transfer portal in, transfer portal out, all sorts of stuff going on during what is normally a quiet time of year. This is just going to be a busy year, all 12 months. And that is not a good, not a bad thing. Lots of lots of stuff to read, lots of stuff to enjoy at BuckeyeScoop.com. So, so be, consider becoming a member there today. Also, make sure you check out our podcast. There's going to be a ton to talk about on those as well. You can find all of them at uh, on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Just search Buckeye Scoop to find those. You can subscribe right there to make sure you never miss an episode. And also leave us a five-star rating and review, which will help other folks find those shows as well. Finally, we will remind you once again, youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. It is all free. It is all fantastic content, all of our podcasts, all of our interviews with players and coaches, all of the times we go to camps and get to scout prospects and interview prospects all in person. That is all at youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. All you have to do is hit the subscribe button there. You'll get notified every time we release a new video and uh, it is all fantastic content, all for free. YouTube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We will talk to you tomorrow.